session. Our setup, as we've become accustomed to in these pandemics, do we need new rules and structures at EU level for the next pandemic, for companies and governments, for new technologies that are shaping our society? All these questions are on the table for citizens to discuss during the Conference on the Future of Europe that began last month in Strasbourg and will continue until next year. During today's Let's Talk About the Future of Europe, organized by the EPP Group, we'll hear from President of Romania, Klaus Johannes, and two leading members of the European Parliament, Group Chair Manfred Weber and Vice Chair Siegfried Mureșan. Welcome everyone, my name is Valentina Pop and I am a Financial Times journalist here in Brussels. I will be the moderator for this session. Our setup, as we've been become accustomed in these pandemic times, will be a little mixed. President Klaus Johannes is joining us live from Bucharest, while here in the studio we have EPP Chair Manfred Weber and EPP Vice Chair Siegfried Mureșan. We will strive for a lively debate despite the screens that separate us and we will take some questions from our virtual audience at the end. First off, let me introduce President Klaus Johannes, who in 2019 hosted the CBU summit where EU leaders first brainstormed about what, if any, changes should be made to the European Union's architecture. At that time, Mr. President, Discussions were revolving mainly around Brexit, but since COVID and the climate crisis, where do you see a need for change? What is Romania's vision for the future of Europe? Does it want to transfer more powers to the EU level or, on the contrary, give them back to member states? Mr. President. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure to greet you. Uh, and. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, uh, I think, extremely important to be a part of this discussion. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was an unprecedented stress test for Europe. This crisis has threatened the very foundations of the European project, the free movement, the function, functionality of the Schengen area, the internal market, the fundamental rights, the economic and financial system, and the union's relations with the rest of the world. Against this background, it becomes obvious that the new changing European and global context requires a process of adaptation to new realities and of reloading the European project. This process, based on the lessons learned from the current crisis, has to lead to a stronger Europe capable of providing solutions for today's challenges. The Conference on the Future of Europe should give the citizens the possibility to indicate where the European Union's action is important for their life. The 10 commitments highlighted in the Sibiu Declaration, which you mentioned, remain fundamental for this reflection, as the Union continues to entail unity, solidarity, cohesion, and a pragmatic, action-oriented approach. The dialogue on the future of Europe will need to offer a medium to long-term vision for the European Union. We need to increase the European Union's resilience, enhancing its capacity not only to tackle emergencies, but also to adjust and drive reforms that will prepare all of us for the opportunities and challenges of the future. In this endeavor, we do not start from scratch. There is already a good basis reflected in the European Union Strategic Agenda 2019-2024. Building 
upon this basis, I think it is appropriate to address three dimensions that will increase the European Union's preparedness for the future. The increased strategic resilience, the enhanced cooperation with the neighborhood, and more developed foresight capacities. The strategic resilience of the Union needs to start as an internal process of transformation and construction. As shown in the first stages of the crisis, it remains essential to ensure the functioning of the single market and the free movement in order to allow the, to, to the vital flows to move and ensure access for all European citizens to the necessary goods in time. On the longer term, the resilience shall be built by taking decisions that will limit the European Union's dependencies. We should not forget that within the European Union, the level of development between the member states and regions is unequal, thus requiring a sustained effort to ensure that the future leads to more cohesion instead of widening gaps. For the European Union to be resilient, we also need a human-centered approach when designing policies and actions. In this context, I would make a strong plea in favor of investing in education and lifelong learning. If not addressed in time, the low skills or low pay model, whatever you want to use, correlated with the economy of the future may generate further development gaps within the European Union, which could affect our societies and challenge the digital and green transformations. The European Union resilience will also need a resilient neighborhood, the Western Balkans, but also our neighbors in the Eastern and Southern neighborhood. The European Union should step up its commitment to its neighbors by supporting reforms and investing more in working together to ensure security. We need to establish more strategic bonds that will confirm the solidity of the European Union's offer and commitment, be it prospects for the EU accession, when conditions are met, of course, or supporting their sustainable democratic development. Finally, the COVID-19 pandemic showed the importance of a foresight capacity and anticipatory governance, encompassing military, security, economic, and strategic foresight, which may support all of us to become more, if I may say so, future-proof. Taken from here onwards, I'm confident that we can be better if we are united. We can be better only together. Thank, thank you for your remarks, Mr. President. Turning to Mr. Weber and Mr. Murashan, um, last year EU leaders, including President Johannes, agreed on an unprecedented post-pandemic recovery package of uh, 750 billion euro, actually 800 billion in current prices. Now, French President Emmanuel Macron, for instance, is suggesting maybe an extension of this fund, even though the money hasn't even started flowing yet. What are your views on this? First of all, we are happy that we can start now. So the late, last uh, decisions are, on the, are now on the table. We have now the guarantee that we can borrow the money, we can spend the money. So there is financial certainty now for the European Union. And the answer we gave to the COVID crisis, at the beginning there were thousands of voices. We had closure of, of borders in Europe. So there was a lot of, yeah, a little bit of a chaotic management because nobody was, was, was prepared for such a kind of a crisis. But when you have now situation in mind, we invest together, we recover together, and we have also the chance to be the first continent vaccinated on global level. So we, we do our job, and that's why Europe is capable to deliver. 
I am really honored as a group leader that President Johannes is today with us. Uh, he, is, he showed in his country, in Romania, that uh, a modern approach, a modern way of, of going into the future, pro-European, non-corrupt, uh, future-proof, how he called it for the European Union, is the way we should do it. And he won in Romania. The citizens support him for this approach to do things. And that's why I'm happy that he also supports when we as EPP are together and consider what do we wish for this conference for the future of Europe? What are the next steps we want to do now? And there, what you said on this uh, recovery fund, that is an example for me to show that we can do things together in a better way. But there is so much ahead of us where we still need further steps to make really Europe strong in us for the next, for the next decade. Mr. Morishan, what are your thoughts on expanding possibly the recovery fund? The, the truth is, ever since the beginning of the pandemic, the European Union acted united. It exercised solidarity with people, with enterprises, with countries in need, and early measures were taken. For example, the first reserve of medical equipment and uh, medical uh, products needed to overcome the pandemic was created at the European level. The European Union played a major role in the vaccines. Um, we flexibilized completely the rules to access EU funds so that money could be used where it was needed during the pandemic. In our home country, for example, in Romania, the government put together a package of 350 million euros which could be used for people who temporarily uh, were in unemployment during the, uh, during the pandemic. But soon, of course, we all together realized that the economic consequences of the pandemic will affect us in the medium term. And this uh, package of uh, economic support, the largest uh, economic recovery package ever created by the European Union, was put together. The philosophy behind it is new and it is unique. The European Commission goes and borrows money on the financial markets and makes it available for all of us, for all 27 member states of the European Union. Some countries say this should become the new normal. This should continue afterwards. Some others say we should be responsible for our own public finances, each of us at national, at national level. The common denominator was that in times of crisis, we act together, we borrow together, and we make the money available where it is needed. I believe that after we overcame this pandemic. The most important thing is that we all act responsibly with public budgets, that we do not overspend, because if we act responsibly, then whenever a new crisis occurs in the future, we have enough savings, we have enough space of maneuver to help those affected by the crisis. I wouldn't exclude that we do again a European package of support if a new crisis occurs, but I believe that for the day-to-day -day business after this crisis, all of us, we have to make sure that um, we respect European rules and that money is spent with care in each of the member states. And staying on the topic of the recovery fund, Mr. President, your government has had some issues in aligning the spending priorities with those agreed at EU level, funding a transition to a greener and more digital economy. Do you see a broader difficulty in some countries, including Romania, where public spending is geared to more pressing needs like schools, hospitals, roads and railways, and may not make full use of the recovery fund? Well, as acknowledged earlier, the European recovery plan we have negotiated and approved at the European Council in July 2020 is of an unprecedented nature and volume, covering both the needs for quick investments and reforms aiming at restoring the sustainable growth as well as the necessity to fulfill the European Union long-term priorities. As for Romania, we have been constantly preoccupied during the negotiation process at the European level about ensuring considerable resources which could further support our investment and development needs together with setting the ground for preparing our economy and society for the requirements of the future, including digital and green transitions. Similarly, when designing the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, we focused on ensuring a balance between our national needs and priorities, including infrastructure, health, 
education and the requirements and objectives agreed at the European level within the framework of the European Recovery Plan. Thank you. Mr. Murashan, you have spearheaded a campaign here in the European Parliament for uh, more transparency on how countries are using the grants and loans from the Recovery Fund. How much insight will the Parliament have in the end? Uh, and what happens if money is misspent? The truth is that we are going to spend in the next years more money at European level than ever before. 1,100 billion euros in the next seven years from the traditional budget of the European Union, money which goes to farmers, to researchers, plus the 750 billion euros from this recovery package, money which will help us to recover after the crisis modernize and enlarge existing hospitals, build new hospitals. And the president has just said it, education should also be a key. In our home country, we will use the recovery package to also help modernize the education system, make schools more digital and prepare the children for the jobs of the future, which will require new skills, which will require more digital skills. And fact is, the more we spend, the more we need to make sure that money reaches the people for which it is really intended. The more we spend, the more transparency we need and the more control we need. And this is why we here in the European Parliament fought a lot with Chairman Weber for democratic legitimacy, for the Parliament having a role in this process and also for local and regional authorities playing a role because it is in the regional and local communities that the money will arrive and it will make a difference. And likewise, we are the political family which defends the rule of law. So we also fought for a strong role of the newly created European public prosecutor in this process. The money from this important recovery package, the European public prosecutor's office will also have a competence to investigate to make sure that it reaches the people that it is intended for. The European Anti-Fraud Office, the Court of Auditors, they will all have a role because, as I said, we are borrowing now for the first time at this unprecedented level. At the end of the process, people need to have a feeling that money was well spent, efficiently, uh, fraud irregularities, if they ever appear to be tackled properly. Of course, Hungary and Poland are not part of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. And Mr. President, speaking of these two countries, um, there is a constant concern with, with these two countries. And to be honest, there were some attempts by previous Romanian governments too about the erosion of the rule of law and uh, the independence of the judiciary system. Do you think the European Union should be given more powers in this area? <clears throat> the values of democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights are the cornerstone of our union with a direct and very significant impact on our institutions and the life of the European citizens. These values are shared by all member states representing the fabric of our societies as well as the main principles that are projected by the Union outside of its borders. They're also something to continuously work on and be vigilant about. This is the reason why the Union has developed a comprehensive toolbox of instruments in this area over the years, which includes mechanisms such as the infringement procedure, the country-specific recommendations in the European semester, Article 7 procedures, and the very recent budgetary conditionality designed to protect, to, to protect the European funds against rule of law violations. Last but not least, the new and comprehensive addition to this rule of law array of tools is the EU-wide rule of law mechanism launched last year. Based on this toolbox, toolbox which adds the European dimension to the instruments we all have and use at a national level, I would say that the Union is well equipped to manage challenges to the rule of law and it is up to 
all of us to make use of the tools at our disposal. If you allow me, I, I, want, to, I want to underline especially the latest uh, step uh, on this tool, uh, tools in front of us. Uh, was a rule of law is a rule of law mechanism. We managed this during the period where we discussed about the MFF together with the recovery fund, 1.8 trillion euros, a lot of money in front of us. And, and we did it together then. And the European Parliament played a key role. And we want to assure citizens that we spend money in the European Union based on the basic principles of rule of law. And what uh, we expect now, uh, so Siegfried and I, well, and from Parliament's point of view, what we expect now is that the European Commission is also using the new tools. Huh? That is not yet the case. No. Uh, uh, we, we need now a Commission who is using the tools. Again, we have some debates about Hungary, for example, about Poland. I don't want to, to blame someone. I, I want to see a neutral assessment, a fact-based assessment about what is going on in the countries. But if Commission comes to the outcome, to the result, that things are not going well, we have published, for example, the case in Czech Republic also on the table. If things are really not going well, then the Europeans expect, and all Europeans expect, that Commission is firm enough to stop payments if they cannot trust in the in the well uh, uh, in the good management of the of the funds. That is what is our expect expectation currently. And if you allow me, that is part also of this broader perspective of this Future of Europe conference. Because if the basic principles are not working, we cannot talk about the future. And uh, what I would wish to see in this conference, having also the words of, of President Johannes in mind, is that we try to identify some kind of, of dreams for the future of Europe. Huh? For example, uh, that still a lot of people, especially young generation, uh, uh, has to have to leave uh, Romania, going to another country to work there, to have a better income there. To dream about a Europe where Bucharest is in the same way attractive to study there like Paris or Munich is currently. Yeah? To, to imagine this, I think that is achievable, that is possible. Or having in mind that we have in today's European Union the challenge that on foreign affairs issues, Russia for example, the big challenge for us, we are not capable to really find strong immediate reactions. In Belarus it was now a special case, but generally speaking we are very weak on these points. And I think to dream about a Europe where we really speak defending freedom fighters in the world yeah. together uh, immediately with one voice. That are the dreams I want to establish. Uh, in my election campaign, I tried to also mention fight against cancer, huh? to, have, to have the idea that we together can beat cancer. I think that, that is what I, what, I, what I link to this conference for the future of Europe, not too theoretical, to be very pr practical in a way that people understand what can it mean for me and for my daily life if we achieve a better Europe. And here, speaking about the point you, you made about uh, health and, and the fight for cancer, ha have you drawn any lessons from the pandemic and how the reaction of the European Union was? Um, maybe adjusting your, your ambition and, and focusing it on what exactly would need to change? Well, you know, I'm from Germany, and if I would have had said uh, two years ago in Germany that health is an European responsibility, it's an European issue, mm then a lot of colleagues, even in my party, I have, to be, I have to be honest, would have had said, sorry, don't, don't occupy too much territory for European competences. Today, everybody says, sorry, obviously with the pandemic, you cannot stop a pandemic on a border. You have to have European activities. So I think the lesson we learned is that, uh, lesson we learned is that we have to, to, to approach the future in a more forward-looking approach, to be more aware about what is in front of us and to answer before the crisis arrives. That is one of the lessons. And a second point, if I may, implementation power. Europe is today a level where we do legislation, where we define rules for farmers, for business, for whatever. But we have not so much implementation power. And I think people would like to see a Europe which is capable to defend, for example, the external border, if a country is not capable to do so, or a, a Europe which is ready to implement the 3% rule uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the Euro, uh, in the Euro rules and so on. So we need also the executive de 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 uh, debate about the European Union capable to deliver, not only to debate and to regulate, but also to deliver. I want to turn back to uh, Mr. President. There are two areas that are pretty much still working progress and where citizens' voices should also be heard. The further expansion of the Eurozone and the Schengen area, both of which Romania still has to join. 
What is your view on the developments of, of these two areas? Well, Romania aims to be at the center of the process of deepening the European integration and further strengthening the European Union. Both the Schengen and the Euro areas represent fundamental pillars of the European construction. Romania's membership, both to Schengen and to the Euro area, is an important step in strengthening our participation in the very essence of the European project. The recent evolutions at the European Union level, including the effects of the pandemic crisis, have highlighted certain deficiencies in areas on which further work is needed to ensure better equipped mechanisms and features in both Schengen and Euro areas. From this perspective, Romania intends to take an active part in all the marches aimed at addressing these challenges. With respect to Schengen, under the developments generated by the health crisis and the measures taken by some member states, the functionality of the Schengen area has obviously been severely affected. Nevertheless, joining the Schengen area remains a major political objective for Romania and the commitment that our country has assumed through the EU Accession Treaty. Romania actually has been meeting the necessary criteria for more than 10 years now, being an example in terms of ensuring security for the European Union. We hope that our consistent efforts will be recognized soon and the solution for finalizing the process will be identified in due time. At the same time, the accession to the euro area is one of Romania's key medium-term objectives. And um, picking up on what Mr. Weber was saying, Mr. Muresan, on, on, the, on the budgetary side, do you see any room for more funding going to health, health care and research? Um, would there be need to expand EU's powers in, in this area? Listening to what the President said, the reflections about the future of the Euro area, the future of the Schengen area, listening to, to the Chairman, to the fact that people expect that we do more in the area of health, I can only say one thing. We saw throughout the last crisis, both in the economic financial crisis ten years ago, in the migration crisis five years ago, but also now, people expect the EU to solve their problems. And in order to solve the problems of the citizens, we also need the tools to do that. And one of the essential tools is, of course, the budget, a robust budget. Um, following the following philosophy, you know, if we have to do more, the budget also needs to be more ambitious. We cannot do more with much less. And this is what we fought together for. The 27 heads of state and government agreed last year, as the president said, on the recovery package. We also supported it into the par in the parliament. So what I want to say is, if the union has new priorities in the area of security, digital, greening, we also need to allocate uh, sufficient resources. And to your question concretely on whether we should allocate more money to health, the answer is absolutely yes. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we as an EPP group demanded the creation of a special EU healthcare solidarity fund. We proposed 50 billion euros there for hospitals. In the end, the big recovery package of 750 billion euros for the whole economy was created, but it is clear that most of the countries will use a significant part of this money also for their medical system. And in addition to this, in the new budget of the European Union, we have a new health program of 5.1 billion euros, which will be used to uh, deploy medical personnel wherever it is needed in the European Union, to train the medical personnel for such European deployments. It will be used to uh, acquire 
at joint European level medical equipment to have enough supplies and it will also be used for research in the area of pandemics and dangers in the area of health so that we would be better prepared in the case of any unexpected any type of a pandemic development in the health in the future. So the answer is we are already doing more in the area of financing health and I think we should continue on this path in the future. And is there any room for manoeuvring in the budget for, let's say, next year, just the EU budget? Like, does the Parliament have any wiggle room there? So, uh, the budget of the European Union is always agreed, in principle, on seven years. And then every year we can adapt based on, uh, based on certain needs they appear. So, uh, the 27 member states, together with the Parliament, we negotiate and if in one area we come to the conclusion that more is needed, then um, we can allocate more. One area where always the 27 member states and the Parliament agreed that more was needed from year to year was research. And I expect us to be able to, uh, to uh, fund more research, particularly in the area of health, if we come to the conclusion that this will be needed to better protect the people in the next years. I want to take some questions from, from the audience. Um, the first question comes from Nora in Belgium and is addressed to Mr. President. Um, it's about disinformation and misinformation campaigns which have plagued the EU in recent years. How can Romania and the EU as such fight, fight these threats? It's, uh, it's quite obvious that we face more and more threats. And one of these threats is disinformation, misinformation. And uh, unfortunately, uh, these phenomena become very present in today's world. Many countries, especially the Western democracies, are subjected to campaigns directed precisely through such means. And we all certainly need a way stronger response. Uh, we could see how aggressive and harmful such disinformation practices can be, including in the context of managing the COVID-19 pandemic or in the implementation of the vaccination campaigns. I'm aware of the solid measures adopted by the European Union, but also by NATO and by their member states. In the case of Romania, uh, the disinformation is an important factor. We take this very seriously and took care that it is mentioned in the national defense strategy. We definitely need to deal with that since it can have a sizable impact on the resilience of a state or a society, especially in the case of democracies. In this sense, the European Union and its member states have a strong interest in cooperating closely in order to address various hybrid threats such as disinformation or cyber attacks. Since you asked about what can be done to deal with that at the European Union level, I would say that the Union needs to show strong solidarity, communicate effectively so that this information cannot hold, and focus on consolidating all the aspects of its resilience. We must engage in closer cooperation with practical and concrete tools to address these critical issues and to strengthen the resilience of the European Union and its neighboring partners. The Euro-Atlantic Resilience Center, which was set up in Bucharest just a couple of days ago, could make a valuable contribution in this regard. Thank you. And staying on the subject of uh, security, there is a question from Florin in Romania, who is asking, will the EU finally lay the groundwork for an EU military rapid reaction capability? I hope so. <laughs> that is uh, 
that is one of the challenges for us. I think the next 10 years, it's a lot about having today's European Union in mind. It's a lot about foreign affairs, about how to manage the European Union's interests in the world. And their military capacity is needed. So I strongly, I strongly believe that the key pillar of our security is NATO. So that is a basic, basic pillar of, of what we call uh, security. But the European dimension of uh, defense is, is currently dominated by, frankly speaking, a lot of waste of money. We do things several times in the European Union. Look, for example, on cyber. We spoke about disinformation, yeah. but look to cyber war, look to the cyber attacks. A few days ago in Ireland, the health system was attacked and a public system was attacked. Uh, and we know that, for example, Russia, China, they have an interest to do so. So we all face the same challenge, but we try to give an answer on 27 uh, uh, mm. level. So for me, this would be a, play, a case where I say, let's start because it's a modern form of defense in the cyber war uh, perspective. Let's do it at the beginning together. Let's create a European cyber uh, defense uh, brigade in the European Union where you have the experts and we all look for these experts because we are lacking them, the experience and the, the knowledge they have. Let's put all the experts together and let's defend together our European internet uh, infrastructure. That could be a very concrete initiative to start with this common European defense idea, especially in the field of cyber. And we also have a question from France, where Nathan is asking how Europe should react to the rise of Eurosceptic political forces. Um, Mr. Weber, if you have any thoughts. <laughs> to, have, uh, to have an offensive approach. Huh? I tell you, when I was a young uh, politician in Bavaria, I was a member of the Jugend user organization of my party, and I had a party convention where Theo Weigel stood in front of me. It was in the mid of the 19th of the last century. And... Uh, and he st stood in front of us and told the CSU delegates, forget about the Deutsche Mark, we do the Euro. And I tell you, that was not popular at all. That was not popular at all in Germany. But Helmut Kohl, Theo Weigel, they did it. And I'm asking myself, where is this future-orientated idea of today? What do we tell people about what is ahead in 10 years? There was no crisis in the 19th, so it was not driven by an economic crisis, something like this. So Kohl and Theo Weigel and others in France and other friends did it because they were convinced that it's needed to avoid the next crisis in front of us. And that's why that is part of my, my thinking when we discuss about the future conference. Let's use this now for discussing this future-orientated initiatives. And I say this in regard to the populists because I think that's the best medicine against populism. If we, if, we, if we lead from the center of politics, from the democratic center of politics in the future, then it's the best medicine against the easy answers from the populists on the left and on the right. So that's why we hope that as EPP, we can really drive this future of Europe debate, like, like President Johannes is doing it in, in Romania, that we are really the driving forces, EPP, in this future of Europe element, because that's the best medicine against uh, populism. And I suppose since this is about the conference on the future of Europe um, and visions for, for the future, I would like to end this, this discussion with the, the same question to all of you. Where do you see Europe in the next 10 to 15 years? Who wants to start? Look, um, I want the European Union in 10 to 15 years to be courageous, to be bold. I want the European Union to solve the problems of the, uh, of the future. I want us to stay united and I want us to evolve because everything around us evolves, including ourselves as individuals. It's normal to uh, evolve and I want us to uh, give the European Union the tools, the instruments which it needs to solve the new challenges which we are facing, be it in the area of protecting the environment, be it in the area of solving diseases or becoming more, more digital. I want us to be united and I also want us to defend European values, to defend them here at home, but to also help to um, promote them around the world. The president, the chairman, myself, we spoke about rule of law, all three of us here today, freedom of expression, freedom of media, freedom of the press. Uh, I want a tolerant and open a union. This is my vision, my view of the union in 10, 15 years. Mr. President, it's your turn. Yes, thank you. 
Well, the union I could imagine should be a union that delivers to its citizens, that offers security and prosperity, a union that acts in unity based on the common goals of the member states. Even in a changing world, the European Union should stick to the objectives that the Founding Fathers aimed for. The answer to these challenges is not simple at all, and the Member States, the European institutions have the responsibility to make the European Union stronger, both internally as well as a global actor. It is therefore important that the European Union will increase its foresight capacities, preparing the European Union to be fit for the future. Consequently, if we take today the best decisions in a cohesive and inclusive manner, the Union I see in a decade or so is a united and coherent Union that builds and delivers on initiatives in partnership with like-minded countries that share our values with organizations and other stakeholders. A union that remains open to outreach and invests in enlarging the basis for a global community built on democracy, rule of law and human rights. I see a union that becomes more responsive and that acts in solidarity. As you may note, I remain a Euro-optimist, as the Romanian citizens are themselves wholehearted supporters of the European project. And I think that what the European Union achieved until now offers a solid basis for managing future challenges and opportunities. Mr. Weber, last word. First of all, great words from the President. So thank you so much for this. And, and I would say the future of Europe is not thinkable with the idea of a democratic Europe. So I still want to strengthen the European Parliament. The link between citizens in all areas of Europe towards Brussels decision-making process. Let's be frank, it's not yet so strong. And that's why we have to improve it. We have to make the people to be the owner of the European development. That is, uh, is my idea for the future democratic Europe. And secondly, you know, um, I am from Bavaria. President Johannes is from the city of Sibiu. Uh, and we all have our regional roots. Huh? Uh, and in my case, with Bavaria, it's a very strong regional identity. I'm a German citizen, that's my passport, and that's my nationality, and I'm an European. Uh, and I, I dream of a Europe where for all of us it's totally normal to don't allow to make a split out of these identities, to keep this together and to fight against those who tell us that this is in contradiction, these identities. There are some, some ideas, some dreams for me when I consider the next steps for Europe. And uh, with that, we are going to wrap up this uh, first EPP group um, Let's Talk Europe uh, event. Keep following the Conference of Europe hashtags um, via um, hashtag COFOE <laughs> and continue the conversation online. Um, from us here in the European Parliament, thank you so much for watching and goodbye for now. Stay safe. <laughs>